Welcome back to the Chosen Journey with the best nickname in sports, Big Money Grip, Steve Carste. I'm the Chosen Lawyer, and Steve, we are back in business, baby. Back again, and end of the baseball season, which is uh, a wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, we're down to a, to a few teams that uh, have a chance to punch their ticket and get to the playoffs. We are in the final week. It's the best time. I was saying, like, baseball fans are in absolute heaven right now. And we're going to get into the playoffs shortly, but we got some administrative items we got to take care of firstly. Uh, and the comical item I wanted to mention before we get started, Steve, was when I set up the Steve Carsey set here, you know, at the studio. <laughs> uh, ever since I acquired those fine pieces of Steve Carsey merchandise, nothing has come up on eBay since. I got very lucky. You know, it's amazing. The one day I go to look, two different sellers have your... 2019 jersey plus your 2019 hat all game used i've not found anything since but you know what it's like the baseball gods are smiling on me that day to get these uh items yeah absolutely you know you never know what you're gonna find on the internet right i mean you can search certain things and, and they're there one day and the next thing you know that they're gone so uh you know all you had to do was really ask me but uh since you went on there and you you found it uh you know i'm glad you did it's a much bigger surprise. Now, alarming for some reason, when I did the Steve Carsey game use search on eBay, at the bottom, they suggested that I may want to purchase an ATM machine for $3,700 Canadian. Uh, is that something to do with the big money grip nickname or what's going on there, Steve? They'll try to sell you anything on the internet. So uh, I don't think that was attached to me. Uh, you would get American money from me and not Canadian. Uh, get us a lot farther for certain. Now, and for the Chosen Journey, we have a proud announcement as well, administratively wise, that we are now fully spreading across the internet and social media. So we've spoken before, how Steve and I connected back the days when I owned um, a blogging site called MLB Reports, and that was my baby for a long time. And then uh, I sold it to my head writer, and that continued on for 10 years as basically a gambling website. And the good news is, is that uh, baseball, like uh, odds makers, etc. And now the MLB Reports website, Twitter account, and Facebook page are now the official sites of The Chosen Journey. So fans, in addition to watching us on the YouTube channel, listening to us on all podcast players, you can now reach us at MLBreports.com. Take a look at the Twitter account, MLB Reports, and the Facebook page. Send your comments. Steve, the uh, baseball fans have gotten more excited and more vicious over time on Twitter. Nothing has changed over the past 10 years. Uh, I am pretty sure that's the case, right? I mean, you've kind of given me a little bit of update. I've, I've stayed away from the uh, whole social media platforms and, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, where people sometimes get to hide behind uh, the curtain a little bit and put their comments out there, good, bad, or indifferent, um, and and you know speak their speak their truth, so to speak, or speak their voice and and let people know what they're thinking. Don't know if this is about to shock you or not, but the most excited, vicious, uh, rare to go people uh, as far as baseball fans go belong to which team? The New York Yankees? The New York Yankees, of course. I have. So uh, uh, so I took a look at our last count. We have 13,000 followers on the MLB Reports Chosen Journey Twitter account. And from all the feed, we have baseball news galore. Yet 90% of the feed is related to the Yankees at all times. And I mean every little aspect of the Yankees. It's incredible. Well, you got to think, right? Judge is chasing history right now. And, you know, obviously he's in Toronto. They're not pitching to him or they're be pitching very carefully to him, I should say. Um, you know, and, and he's doing what he does. Uh, he's become, you know, this, this player who has really grown over the years and has come into his own and uh, really understands the game and who he is and, and what he's capable of doing. And, uh, you know, he's a tremendous player that's uh, – going to be a free agent possibly i don't think that's gonna end up coming to fruition but uh he's carried that team uh pretty much uh, the entire year and uh he's just uh he's one of those guys where i look at the game and i look at it and in like 
you can't leave this let this guy leave New York. He's he's kind of in the mold of the of the Derek Jeter, uh, the way he handles himself on and off the field. And uh, you know, any team would be be lucky to have a guy like that. I have a few points that we were going to discuss about Mr. Judge, and he'll come up uh, throughout the conversation of the next few episodes for sure. Uh, he was wearing the shirt the other day, basically saying uh, New York or nobody or something like that. So I think he's making it pretty clear. I think that the Yanks probably wish they could have fought a little harder in the offseason and found a way to sign him, come to some sort of agreement. I think Mr. Judge betting on himself did fairly okay. I think that the uh, Brinks trucks, not Brinks truck, the trucks are going to be lining up outside his home. He's going to be doing pretty well this year. I, I, On Twitter, they seem pretty convinced that the Giants have a chance. I don't think there's any chance. I agree with you. I think he's coming back to the Yanks a thousand percent. But I also think that right now he has a little bit more on his mind. Certainly, we'll talk about his home run chase and there's something, a little something called the playoffs coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, exciting part uh, on Twitter is the interactions. I've always loved that part compared to every other social media. I mean, you and I met for the uh, three seconds you were on Twitter. So that was pretty hey. cool on the connection wise. Uh, Mr. John Gibbons, ex uh, twice uh, manager of the Blue Jays, has now an account going. He joined Twitter in August. He has a podcast going as well that just launched recently. Uh, he had Mr. Donaldson. Josh Donaldson was on. Alex Manoa was on as his guest. And people are loving Gibby right now. It's pretty cool. Somebody who just came out of it. And uh, he's uh, he likes to speak his mind, certainly. He's not shy on there. And uh, he's having a lot of fun with it. So it's been pretty cool connecting with him. He says hello, and he's uh, excited about uh, the chosen journey as well. And an old friend of yours uh, came out of the blue, somebody I loved watching back in the day, Mr. Kareem Garcia says hello. Now, I recall that yourself and Kareem were playing on the Yanks together. Turns out it was the 02 Yanks, but it was also the 01 back then Indians, now Guardians. So you were playing back-to-back -back times with Kareem. So... What was life like with Mr. Kareem Garcia back in the day? Uh, yeah, he's a funny guy. He's a he's a character. He likes to speak his mind, and he plays hard. That's that's what that's what you always love about the guy. Uh, you know, I was only in in Cleveland for the half a year in two thousand one before I got traded, uh, so I had a short time with him. But uh, like I said, uh, you know what you're going to get when he comes to the ballpark, and you know what you're going to get when uh, he steps on the field. So it, it was a joy to play with him. Uh, interesting little tidbits about Mr. Kareem Garcia. So in addition to playing MLB baseball, he played in Japan, he played in Korea, and he played in Mexico. So Kareem kept going. Whichever country would take his passport and hand him a ball and a bat, he was ready to go. And he's a three-time representative of, on the WBC Mexican team. He was on 06, 09, and 2013. And I got to say, watching him live in WBC action, that we had an opening round once in Toronto here. I believe it was the 09 series, if I'm not mistaken. And man, Kareem just goes all out all the time. He was the heart and soul of that team. His teammates all loved him. The fans loved him. Really interesting dude. And he was very, very excited to hear about the show. And he said, oh, send Steve my regards. He was very, very happy. And uh, maybe we'll twist his arm. He's now in Texas, actually, out of all places. So he's living life in Texas. He has family close by in Mexico. And uh, internet connection is good. So we may very well find him on the chosen journey one day. Absolutely. You know what we call those type of players, right? We call them grinders. And, uh, you know, there, there are a few of those in the big leagues. And, and again, those are the guys that uh, you always root for. Those are the guys that, uh, you know, you hope that do well because, you know, they're putting their heart and soul into it. Seems to me also that uh, very few championship teams do not make it without the grinders. Those guys are the glue that put it together. So uh, when we looked at our analysis of that past Yankees team, and there was a mix of everybody. There were grinders, superstars. It was unreal. Like It seemed like there was like three rosters of players on there. So uh, it's amazing when you construct those teams. And uh, looking into the playoffs now and who's left in the construction, you know, if we had put our monies down as far as what's going to be the playoff series going into October. I don't know necessarily we would have been correct. I pulled up the latest standings. So let's jump into the playoff picture right now. So we know the Yanks, the guardians, I'm still getting used to that. Sorry. So I keep saying Indians. So I'm, I'm I apologize in advance, but I'm trying to remember guardians. We got the Yanks, the guardians and the Astros. We know they're coming through. We know the cards and Dodgers are coming through. 
The Mets and Braves are fighting tooth and nail to get that last uh, buy spot, and the other team is going to make it in the wild card. And how tense is it right now in the uh, Braves and Mets clubhouses, would you say? Uh, you know, that, that's a great question. I mean, every team takes it a little bit different. Uh, some teams play a little bit looser. Uh, they both know that they're in the playoffs, so they have nothing to lose, right? They're going to go out there. They know they're a good team. They got wins in the 90s. It's either 96 or 97 wins for, for those teams. And, uh, you know, they're just going to go out and play baseball. Uh, it's it's great because um, I, I think uh, the weekend uh, coming up is they have a three-game series against each other. And, uh, you know, that'll be a lot of fun for those guys because that's probably going to dictate who wins that division and uh, which other team gets that wild card. Yeah, and you know, it's I remember that one year when the Mets held that lead and they had the final series against the Marlins and they blew whatever huge lead they had going into it and I don't think Mets fans have forgotten that either. So, it it's like right now, you know, I, I as a fan looking at it, if I'm the Braves, I'm the defending champs, you know what? I got nothing to lose. I'm going in there. It's all good. It feels like the more the pressure's on the Mets being in New York, place based on how the Yanks are playing as well, they really want to take that division. But it's a lot of fun. A lot of great players on both teams. Uh, we're going to talk about the Mets' uh, rotation in a moment because I think they're just absolutely stacked. It's unbelievable. I don't know what they're going to be doing for a playoff rotation, but that's a good problem to have, certainly. And that AL East and the NL East turn out to be the toughest divisions by far. Like, how many representatives are probably going in from both teams? With the wild card right now, you know pretty much the Jays are in, the Rays are in, and the Mariners after reconstructing their roster so many times, they are they're sliding through. And then we got either the Braves or Mets, the Padres, and the Phillies. And your last team, the Brewers, are still digging in there. They're not going quietly into the night. Yeah, they're hanging tough. I mean, obviously, yeah, I've been watching them the last few days. Uh, you know, and the one caveat to both the Brewers and the Phillies uh, chasing that last wild card, because I think the San Diego Padres, after the win last night over the Dodgers, uh, actually probably punched their ticket, not uh, mathematically, but, uh, you know, I, I think they're they're in. And then the Braves Mets, uh, just one caveat, uh, again, with the Brewers and Phillies and the Mets and, and Atlanta, is that there's no game 163 this year. If there's a tie, it 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 goes back to season series. Whoever wins the season series is considered the winner of the division or the consider the winner of the wild card. So actually the Brewers have to play one game better than the Phillies. They can't tie the Phillies. They have to pass them to gain that last wild card spot because they lost the season series to the Phillies four games to three. And, you know, watching yesterday, uh, the Brewers did not do themselves any favors. You know, the Phillies did what they needed to do. They lost, but the Brewers couldn't get that win. And every game now counts. Like, it is so tight. And, you know, it's so funny. You have 162 games to get this thing settled out, and you're down to the final week. Like, how frustrating is that? I remember not that long ago, you know, it's funny because we'll talk about this stuff, but it's you got the Brewers and you got the Cards, and they were neck and neck forever, and somehow the Cards just pull away. The same way Goldschmidt seemed to be getting the triple crown and then things just happen over the last couple of weeks, you know, that's where it's never over until it's over. Yeah. Baseball is a, a very difficult game. Things can change in a heartbeat. Uh, momentum can change. Um, you know, obviously the, the Brewers were up four games on, on July 30th going into uh, the month of August. And obviously you've seen, seen what happened. Um, you know, the trading deadline, the Cardinals made some moves and got some starting pitching and kind of rounded out what they did. They got some guys healthy, um, you know, coming back into that rotation and back into that bullpen. And then you have a lineup that just started to, to mesh and to grow and, and to develop some chemistry. Uh, we all know what uh, Goldschmidt and Arenado can do. And then, you know, you had the young guys like Donovan and, uh, you know, a few other those other those guys uh, step up and, and start playing well and, uh, you know, they got on a roll. A lot of it has to do with uh, the schedule that you're playing. Sometimes you, uh, you know, get a good draw in a certain month and, and you play some weaker teams when you're playing well. And, and that's sometimes when it, when it turns. Uh, injuries have, have hit the Brewers uh, throughout the year. They've lost a lot of guys in their starting rotation. Uh, but nobody's going to cry over that, right? I mean, um, you've got to continue to move on and it's the next man up. And, 
you got to try to continue to uh, push and and try to get as many wins as you can. Um, and and at the end of the day, uh, you know the the Cardinals just uh, were a little bit better than the Brewers to win that division. And then you just restart it all come playoff time. And uh, we a couple of teams I was thinking of as we're looking now at the matchups that are coming up, but the Orioles and the White Sox, like the Orioles, everybody wrote them off for dead completely, you know, and uh, I think they were at the end of the day, the surprise of baseball. They stayed in as long as they did. Uh, I went to see a couple Orioles games this year and I'm looking at this roster and I'm like, this would be a great matchup in triple a, but like, what the heck are these guys doing here in the show? And you know what? They grinded it all year. And I think we got to salute them that they stayed in it as long as they did. And you know what? If they pick up a couple pieces in free agency, maybe they start contending, but it just shows how deep that AL East is. And the other team I'm thinking of is the white Sox. You know, they had their managerial change when La Russa was unhealthy and had to step down. And, um, but it didn't work out for them either at the end of the day. Orioles, White Sox, did you see them entering the playoff picture or are they just uh, surprised for as long as they could? Well, to be quite honest with you, I had the White Sox uh, before the season started contending for that division. Uh, they got a, a tremendous lineup. Uh, they got talented players, you know, again, injuries uh, to Lance Lynn and a couple of those guys, Giolito, uh, hurt them during the year, but uh, that's part of baseball. It's a, it's a long season. And, and you got to continue to withstand any of those injuries. And, you know, the, the surprise to me was the Guardians. Uh, I didn't have them winning that division uh, when before the season started. They, their payroll is, I think, 30 out of 30. Um, you yeah, know, they're only working with a, anywhere like a 36 to a $40 million payroll with the guys that they have. Um, so that, that was a little bit of a surprise to me in that uh, central division uh, with the Guardians and, and the White Sox. The Orioles, they've been rebuilding for a long time. They have a lot of talented young position players. Um, I, I think they're going to be good. They just got to revamp some of their pitching and, and, and you know, develop some, some pitching there uh, within their organization and maybe add a free agent or two to, to kind of shore up and, and find a leader on that staff. And you never know what can happen. They traded Trey Mancini, got some pieces back for him. Um, and, and continue to contend. And, and that's what rebuilding is. And, and hopefully they can continue to do what they need to do and compete in the AL East uh, for years to come. Now, I know that the uh, the Central, the AL Central is the weak sister right now. And, uh, well, I mean, the West outside of the Astros, obviously. But, you know, the Guardians, they, they were a very fun team, young team. Uh, you know, Tito Francona is right now getting so much praise as far as what he's done with that squad. And, you know, as considering what he's done over the course of his managerial career, like, he, you know, just what do you say about the guy? I mean, the guy is a hall of famer and uh, he will be managing as long as he wants to. Is, is that the secret? I mean, is it essentially strong manager, strong organization support and young players coming up together and clicking? Is that the formula for them? That's part of the formula and, and having good prospects and having good players. I mean, that's another formula. Jose Ramirez is a really good player in the middle of their lineup. Uh, playing in a weak division is another plus. Uh, you know, I don't know. Put them put them in the NL, uh, put them in the NL East, put them in the AL East. They're not in first place. They're 12 games behind, right? So uh, it's always, a, it's always a, that you're fortunate that you find the division that you're in that, that might not be the best. Listen, the NL Central isn't the greatest division either. You know, you have the Pirates, uh, the Reds, and the Cubs. Uh, I don't know if any of them got to, to 75 wins this year. So, um, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's it's part of baseball. It's the way they have the division set up unless they realign them to do what they want. But uh, there's a lot of things that go into it. But I think you hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, the chemistry with young players and uh, wanting to go out there day in and day out and, uh, you know, prove themselves. Um, having a few leaders on that team, like a Jose Ramirez and a Shane Bieber and uh, a couple, and then development, uh, development of their pitchers and players and having good front office and, and, and supporting staff that uh, come to work every day to, uh, to make guys better. Now let's take a look. So that's the grinding team, so to speak. We got these monsters sitting at the top that are getting their buys this year. We got the Astros, the Yanks, the Dodgers. I'm going to say the Mets, but it could be the Braves. So we got these four teams, you know, that, uh, you know, maybe get to go play a little bit of golf, go get a couple massages, rest for three days, sleep in. 
Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, they're probably going to be training and going to be working through fundamentals and getting ready, psyched up. Uh, the debate on Twitter right now, is it, is it going to help them or hurt them in most cases? Now, having been there, uh, from your experience, what do you think is going to happen for those teams? Are they going to come ready to go or are they actually going to be rusty out of the gate? Is it an advantage or disadvantage to get that by in your estimation? Uh, team by team. Uh, I, 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 it could go either way, to be honest with you. I think a veteran team will will be prepared. I think a younger team, if they if they had this buy, uh, would be less prepared and 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 be a little bit rusty. Um, you know, they what they're gonna do is they're gonna go out. Um, you know, they're gonna take their ground balls. They're gonna take their BP. Pitchers are gonna throw bullpens. They might have a pitcher throw a, a simulated inning to a couple hitters just to keep the feel of his pitches and and keep the intensity up. Uh, but all in all, on a strategic level, I would see, say it's an advantage because the teams before them have to pitch their three guys, one, two, and three, if it goes three games. And, you know, uh, you obviously cannot get the number one again the way the schedule is lined up because it's not going to be that fifth day. So you're going to be facing the number four against your number one um, when when the time comes. and. You know, how that plays out is, is anybody's guess. I mean, you can play the game on paper if you want, right? Uh, but it's, it's not guaranteed. It's uh, it's a little bit of Russian roulette there as far as setting up those pitching schedules. And we've had those debates all the time. I hear it in Toronto all the time. What happens if we got to uh, secure the home field advantage? Are we going to pitch our number one? What are we going to do? And all the teams are kind of questioning this thing. You know, do you have, are you going to burn through your best starter to make sure you secure your standing in the playoff race? Are you going to save them for the divisional? Uh, I don't know. I think you always have to win for today and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, from my experience, he's watching the game. If you don't bring out your best players for uh, make or die games, you're going to get burned most of the time. So I think you're going to see, my, I think all the teams are going to be pitching their one, two, and threes in those wild card games. I don't think they're going to save them in the hopes that uh, they're going to slide by. No, absolutely not. You, 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 you. In the playoffs, there's no guarantees. It's a bounce here, bounce there, a good break, a good call, a bad call. Uh, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna play. If a game, if a team's up 2-0, they maybe not throw the number three, and they may throw a number four and see if they can have the number three go. Um, the next series against the number one, I don't know. But at the end of the day, um, I don't think anybody's going to uh, not pitch their best guys uh, in the first round of the playoffs. And uh, looking looking at it and thinking ahead to it, uh, it's not like, and I like how they did this because if you got to go in the wild card game, you're going three consecutive days. This is not three games spread out over a week or so. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about, people, it's not a week off. It's not a week off. It's three days. Three days. You know, if you include travel, rest, I think three will go by pretty quickly. So I would say in my mind, Steve, if it was a week plus, yeah, I could see a little bit of the rust. I think having the three consecutive days really gives an advantage to the buy teams and really burns out those wildcard teams. So if I'm the Braves or Mets, I want that buy a thousand percent. I do not want to go into the wildcard game if I can avoid it. Yeah, well, they can play their best players come down the stretch because if you do get the bye, you get those three days to, uh, you know, get get rest and recovery and, and get back into, uh, you know, what you want to do and set up what you want to need. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're going to be playing hard. I mean, obviously, uh, the series at the end of the at the end of the week here is is definitely going to be big, and and I think you're going to have eyes all eyes on that in the baseball world to see who wins that uh, division and 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 at least. There was ever a time for us to acquire a Twitter account and go hog wild and connecting with the fans. Now was the time in this season. Uh, I can't remember. And, you know, based on what happened with, you know, the COVID times and lockdowns, etc. It's now this season, you know, as far even in Canada now, uh, they're going to be opening up apparently for the playoffs for all the players. There's never been a time as far as I've seen from baseball, player, baseball fans, sorry, such a joy that's saying the game is back, everybody's back, and new system with the wild card system as far as how it's set up. There is just such a buzz, and it's so good to see real baseball being played and fans just really excited. It's so refreshing. Well, do you think it's a coincidence that Canada lifted the COVID restrictions now that the uh, Toronto Blue Jays are in the playoffs? Do you think that Major League Baseball is going to allow the Yankees 
to go play the Jays if that's the case without Anthony Rizzo or maybe a couple of those other players who are not vaccinated. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a little quirky timing on, on, you know, the country to kind of lift that. But I do think that uh, baseball had a hand in getting some of that uh, taken care of. Which is kind of funny because, you know, Trudeau and the amount of support he has or doesn't have in Canada, Blue Jays fans are livid with him. There's the one group that are saying, keep the restrictions during the playoffs. What are you doing? You're killing us. This would have been great. But I agree with you that there's a little bit of negotiations going in the background. It's an interesting timing right before the playoffs. You know, coincidences, not coincidences. But if from a baseball fan perspective, it's nice to see that you know, all the players will be able to play in Toronto, depending on how far the Jays go. Uh, that being said, Jays fans are not very happy, but they are very happy for a couple reasons right now, as we're going to talk about uh, their upcoming series as uh, projected right now. Number one, Alex Manoa is absolutely the talk of the town here. You cannot go anywhere without somebody singing his praises, showing his numbers against every ALS, a, a, every AL East team and how he's been succeeding. Uh, from the All-Star game on, I mean, I think that this secret got let out. This guy is a true superstar. He's a true workhorse. Toronto is so lucky to have him. Yeah, he's uh, he's solid, that's for sure. I mean, obviously, he's still early in his career and he's young. And, you know, this, there's getting more uh, video out on him and more information out. But, uh, you know, there's no denying that his stuff plays. His stuff is good. Uh, you know, he, he can compete in, in the toughest or one of the toughest divisions in baseball uh, every fifth day, uh, especially, you know, with, with the way the divisions are set up. That's going to change next year where it becomes more of a balanced schedule and they're going to kind of cut games off the, the AL East uh, that teams play or throughout the league uh, within division games. So, uh, you know, again, uh, it, it's nice to have those numbers against the teams that you play the most and uh, be successful. And it's a reason why the Jays are where they're at. And, uh, you know, he should be getting the praise and he should be getting the accolades that uh, that come his way. He stays healthy. He bets on himself. Uh, the payday will come for him. There's no doubt based on how he's going. And another guy that's really the talk of the town right now, aside from John Gibbons, uh, starting off his own uh, social media campaign, who, by the way, he loves Manoa and has been stating that, is Mr. John Schneider. And how nice for John to see, you know, him getting his kick at the can. And even if the Jays don't make it out of the wild card uh, run, I'm going to tell you right now, he's come back. I don't see any doubt that this guy, obviously he's clicked on all cylinders with the team. And it's been great to see how the team has played for him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Change is good sometimes, right? I mean, sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. The Phillies may change. Um, and, you know, just to have a, a young team play hard for you, they're, they're a talented team, right, Toronto? I mean, I think that's what you guys up there uh, all see. You know, you got the the Biggio, the, the Vladdies, uh, you know. Bichettes. I mean, yeah, the Bichettes. And you got some of the, uh, you know, uh, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., right? Like, uh and then you get some of the veterans mixed in like a Springer or somebody, and it helps lead that club. So, uh, you know, there's always helps behind the scenes with the players and, and in the clubhouse. But, uh, you know, to, to have a team play hard for you is, is, is something to be noted. Well, I, I was going to talk about this in a moment, but since we're let's finish off with the Jays, just because it's, it's, it's on my mind right now, looking at some of these numbers. Uh, you got Manoa and you got Gosman, you know, and, you know, they're going one and two. And, you know, they, they lost Ryu and uh, he was supposed to be their ace. Uh, I'm seeing Stripling right now as their number three. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You cannot put Berrios in there at number three based on how he's been pitching. I think Stripling has been consistent. I think in my mind, even despite the contract or whatever, you got to give yourself the best chance to win and you got the hot hand. He's getting in there. Your thoughts? Uh, I think it comes down to the matchup. Uh, if Berrios plays a team that he's pitched well against this year, he might be in that number three slot. I, I really do. I don't know who the Jays are going to play in their first round, but uh, I would bet after we figure out that and you go back and you look at Berrios' numbers this year's and this year and his career against that certain team, uh, if, if the numbers tell you that this is the guy to pitch, I think the Jays will pitch him. If, if it says, hey, man, you know what? Maybe uh, Stripling's a better uh, go, um, then we'll do it. If their Jays are up 2-0, might be a different story. Uh you know, and they may say Berrios for the first game 
uh, out of uh, the wild card if they're able to secure, you know, where they need to be. But, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, again, uh, I just think that, uh, you know, a lot has to do with how you're pitching, but also who you're pitching against. And, and, and time will tell with that including with the uh, Mets rotation, which I w- we're going to talk about in a moment as well, that uh, when you have the luxury of having four or five amazing starters and you don't know who to pitch, you have this luxury where all of a sudden one guy goes to the pen, but if any of your starters is showing weakness early on, you can literally throw a guy in there all of a sudden and you can pitch seven innings as if he started. So it's pretty neat when you have that kind of luxury. Not all teams have that. Another luxury the Jays have actually in connecting to one of your old friends uh Lead off home runs. Mr. George Springer just hit one the other day. I believe it was last night and of this taping. And Springer is up to 52 lead off home runs. I didn't realize he had that many. The current record, of course, held by your, you know, your BFF, Ricky Henderson, with 81. 81 games he let off with a home run. Nobody's ever touching that record. I can't see that. Now, number two and three on the list. Any idea who they are? I I don't I my my brain wouldn't work that fast uh, if if I if it had to I, I would have to think about it if I I needed to to go back and and maybe see who two and three are for consistent leadoff hitters uh, I will say Tony Phillips just for for giggles but uh, he's the only one that comes to my head I don't know if Tony Phillips ever hit fifty home runs in a whole career but no uh, it's funny because Doug, Doug Landville brought up the other day on Twitter that. Uh, mm-hmm. That Judge has more home runs this season than Glanville hit his whole career because Gl- Glanville hit 59 in his whole career. And uh, how about Jimmy Rollins? Jimmy Rollins would be incorrect. I would have never <laughs> guessed number two and three on this list. By the way, Springer, by the time he's done his career, is going to be number two on the list. He will not catch Ricky. There's no chance. Uh, it's not going to happen. But we got Afonso Soriano with number two at 54 mm. home runs. Another Steve connection. Number three blew my mind. Havin's dad, Craig Biggio, is number three with 53 home runs. I love those killer bees, man. When you look back at that team, like Biggio is like catcher, second base, outfield. I loved watching Craig Biggio, man. He was such, he was a spark plug. He's another one of those grinders, like you say. He brought his lunch pail every day and came to work. And yeah, Craig Biggio sits at number three in the all-time list with 53 leadoff home runs. So George Springer, number 52, will be catching them. And then he'll be one and two with Ricky, looks like. Yeah, I mean, you never know. He's still got some time to, to play. I mean, if he sits in that leadoff hole for a while, uh, 30 home runs isn't really that big of a spread. I mean, leadoff home runs, you're getting fastballs all the time. It's 162 games. You hit, I don't know, five a season, maybe? I don't know. Maybe he has a a year where he hits ten. I he's he's still got the power, and uh, it'll be it'll be a fun watch. If George Springer overtakes that Ricky Henderson uh, record, we will replay this one day. Steve Carse said it first. He's the only person in baseball that's believing in Springer in that. I love Springer. Don't get me wrong, but you know, uh, it, like you said, baseball's a funny game. Slumps, injuries. You think it's going so well one moment, and you never freaking know. So mm-hmm. now that being said, let's take a look at, at our crystal ball right now. If the season ended today, we'd have four playoff games. We'll be excited to watch on October 7th. First game would be the Rays and Jays. Looks like the Jays has secured home field advantage. Thank goodness for them because they do not like playing at the Trop. Not that anybody likes playing at the Trop. Uh, everybody's going with the Jays on this one in baseball. Would you agree, or you think the Rays got a chance? I think the Ray has have a chance. I hate to say it to you, but uh, this team is a strange team for me. They always, they pitch well, and they always find a way at the end of the game for somebody to come through. I mean, obviously they have to be healthy, but uh, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, they've been there, they've done it. Um, you know, they have some new guys on that team, but I just think the, I think it's going to be a great series. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I think it can, can come down to, you know, the last inning of that series of either team winning the game or the series. I think every one of those series is going to go pretty much to three games. I can't see it otherwise. Just the way three game series works. It's going to be really hard to sweep the 2-0 just because of the momentum and the pitchers. But you never know. Uh, sometimes Steve will not say it, but I will because I can because I've not been affiliated with any Major League Baseball team. 
not because I live in Toronto, but just watching these teams, I think if the Jays were playing at the Trop would be a different story, but them playing at home, I think Jays are, are moving ahead on this one. Uh, but I think that'll be a really hard fought series. I think they'll be grabbing those ice packs and uh, heating pads, <laughs> limping into the divisional series after that one. Yeah. Uh, the next one in the AL, um, I, I think also is a pretty clear cut one is the Mariners and Guardians. And uh, I, I just love what the Guardians are doing right now. I think that they got a lot of momentum on their side, and uh, I, I think they're going ahead. See, I'm on the opposite side of that. I think that, uh, you know, with with the acquisition of Castillo and some of those guys in the bullpen that uh, Seattle has, um, if, if they jump out to any type of lead, because the Guardians – they're a team that, that can go dry pretty quick and not score runs. So if they can't keep up on the scoreboard with the Seattle Mariners, I think the Mariners have enough pitching to slide by that series. Even though it's in, in Cleveland? Even though it's in Cleveland, yes. Okay, so interesting. So just to go back, though, to the Rays and Jays, if you are predicting one, are you predicting Rays or Jays, if you had to pick one? I will disappoint a lot of fans in Toronto, but I'm going to go with the Rays. Okay, buddy, we still got the picture of you throwing the ball. It's all, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, moving on to the NL. Uh, I don't really care who the Padres are facing, whether it be the Mets or the Braves. They are going home after round one. That I'm sure we could agree on. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Raise, raise, uh, raise. And Mets or Braves uh, facing the Padres. I think the Padres sneak a game out somewhere. They got you, Darvish. Uh, again, I just don't think that uh, that they're going to be able to keep up on the scoreboard. I mean, I know that they got a good lineup and a good club, but uh, what I've been watching lately from from the Padres, uh, they're just there's just no consistency in what they're doing. It's a good game. It's a terrible game. It's a mediocre game. Where these other two teams uh, in the NL East uh, are, are 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 bringing the hammer every game. So I, I, I'm with you. I got uh, either the Braves or the Mets, uh, you know, knocking out the uh, San Diego Padres. And are you still going with the Braves for the division? I'm still going with the Braves for the division. Okay, I'm still going with the Mets, man. I think Timmy Trumpet's going to be playing for that during that uh, that those three days off. Uh, with the Padres, you know, ever since Tatis, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, his uh, haircut infection and all that good stuff, I think that did not help the team whatsoever. It's a shame, you know, and, uh, you know, it's even one guy out of the lineup, like right now with the Mariners, they had a little bit of injuries and people come back, but, you know, that can all of a sudden tell a story, you know, we're making these predictions, but it's all of a sudden one person gets injured or falls into a terrible slump, everything can change, right? So this, of course, aside, I'm assuming that everybody's healthy. The other one, the game going on will be the Phillies likely might be your Brewers against the Cardinals, my pick for the World Series. And um, I think it'll go three, but I think the cards will heat up again in the right time. Yeah, I mean, I guess we got to see, right? Who's going to uh, who's going to get that last wild card spot? I mean, again, the the Brewers have to uh, play one game better than the Phillies coming down the stretch. If the Phillies play, you know, I think we we discussed this yesterday. If the Phillies play four and four. They got the Brewers. Got to go six and six and two or seven and one to overtake them. So that's it's mathematically yes, it's possible, but it, it's a really tough road. Even though it says a game and a half, but it's really two and a half because of the the tiebreaker situation. And they're they're a scary team, the Phillies. They still got some weapons in there, and uh, they're not going so quietly. But uh, would you say Phillies or Brewers if they come in uh, cards? Have any chance of getting blown out here, or you think the cards still got all the momentum? What's your uh, estimation? I think the cards got the momentum, but I, I actually think the Brewers have a better shot of of beating the Cardinals than the Phillies, only for the fact that they're very familiar with the division opponent and they, you know, know them extremely well. So that that could go uh, either way. Where the Phillies, I just don't think they have enough pitching, especially behind their starters uh, in the bullpen. Uh, to to close teams out. I think they're both scary teams for the cards to face regardless. I don't think they want to face their division rival. I mean, they are 
every year, every year. I don't think they want to see them. I think if they had a choice, you know, it's lesser of two evils for them. But if I were them, I'd rather have the Phillies just because I'm just sick of the Brewers, man. Like they're on my chops every year. It feels like, you know, those two teams until one day the Reds and Cubs rebuild, which will happen sometime in our lifetime for sure. Now, turn to divisional wise, as far as uh, the, the teams that, that I was looking at rotations and there's only one team with the rotation that really sticks out to me right now. And that's that Mets rotation with them all coming together. Like I didn't realize Bassett was as good as he was. Like he could be a number one on so many teams. You got Scherzer, DeGrom, Carrasco has really turned it around. And T1 Walker has had an outstanding season. Like good for him. I remember when he spent a cup of coffee with Toronto, came up as a highly touted prospect, injuries derailed him. We thought that he may not come back. And look at that one to five. Like the Mets have to be laughing going into the playoffs right now. Yeah, you know they got, uh, in my opinion, uh, the best or one of the best rotations going into the playoffs. They're healthy, uh, you know, uh, for the most part. You know, you never know at the end of the season. But Degrom has most of the season off, right? Uh, he doesn't have, but maybe ten starts, and and they've built him up for uh, what essentially is going to be their their playoff run with with him leading that that uh, rotation along with, with Scherzer. It's a heck of a one-two punch that you can have going into to any series. Uh, you have to face those guys four times. It, it reminds me of uh, the 2001 run by the Arizona Diamondbacks when they had Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling. That's kind of the kind of the one-two punch that uh, the, the Mets uh, remind me of. And, and I think they're going to they're gonna do really well. It's just uh, how, how much is their offense going to be able to score and if they're able to score some runs, I, I think they're going to be able to uh, to hold up. We'll talk about their offense in a moment, one particular player. But uh, imagine a, a player not hustling on that team during the playoffs or somebody not putting max effort. Would you want to be with Scherzer in the clubhouse afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I think Max's presence brings uh, a, a different uh, dynamic to that clubhouse and that and that club. Obviously, Buck Showalter now leading that. Uh, he's not scared to... Uh, uh, have his presence known uh, about hustling and doing that. And, and I, I, I do think that's why that team has played as well as they've played throughout the year is, you know, not that the other guys didn't have it, but there's just a different respect level that comes with uh, a Buck Showalter who's done it for a very long time or, you know, uh, a guy in a dugout that uh, has been sitting there and, and has gone through teams and has led teams like a Terry Francona. You know, I think that, Young players just play hard for him. I think veterans play hard for him, and uh, they understand each other. And he's not willing, uh, or he is willing to, you know, sit you down and and, and tell you that uh, you need to be better if 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 you're not putting in the the time or the work to do so. Always had a lot of respect for Showalter, and he's got a really hard decision. Assuming everybody's healthy, uh, he's gonna have to decide on that number four starter because there's no five starters going into the playoffs, and it's gonna come down between Carrasco and Walker. Uh, I think smart money's on Carrasco, but if anybody gets injured or somebody falters, Walker's ready in the wings. Uh, I assume if I'm Walker, I'm just happy to be there. I'm I'm happy to be, you know, uh, playing, not injured, be part of this team and take any role I can get. I mean, yeah, from an outside perspective, that's how you look at it. But the guy always wants to, you know, pitch in those situations and, and be the number four again. I think there's a lot that goes into it, uh, you know, when you, when when front offices or uh, staffs make these, these managers or you know pitching coaches or whatever makes these decisions. It's let's see who who we're playing. How is Carrasco done against this team? How is uh, Tajon Walker done against this team this year? And if one guy has dominated a certain team that they play, say they play the Braves at some point. Uh, I promise you, they're going to go with the guy who's pitched well against them because uh, that's just the uh, what the numbers say, and uh, that's that's the way that teams are going nowadays with uh, the the analytics and and how they plug things into the computer. Yeah, I was looking at that the other day. I was reading an article about that, and both of them play very poorly against uh, above five hundred teams, and they both excelled against teams that are under five hundred. So I'm sure the team, like you're saying, and the players on those teams, they're going to analyze like they, so it's not even just necessarily the team you're playing against. They also look at each of the hitters. Like they look at all these kind of stats, right. To figure out if, if there was a trade and this guy just came over, how, if you ever pitched against him, like they, they're really grinding these numbers down, aren't they? 
Oh, uh, they're grinding them down. I mean, that's what uh, the analytic department does. Is uh, you know, who has a better who has a better breaking ball, Carrasco or Walker? Uh, that that's going to be you know probably Carrasco. So if they're playing a team who's hitting 169 off of breaking balls, uh, I would bet that Carrasco would get the game four start as opposed to Tyjon Walker. Uh, you know, then they would take away even though Carrasco has a really good changeup. Uh, Walker has that really good split, right? So. If, if they break down the numbers and says this team hits X off of off speed and they only hit X off of the splitter and he keeps the ball on the ground, maybe he's the guy who gets game four. So I think there's a lot of things that, that are determined uh, pending the team you play and, and the hitters that are going to be in that lineup and who's on the roster.